Very good morning, church, and warm welcome to you. Let's just quiet down our hearts and learn to be still before the Lord as we come to worship Him this morning. Let's stand and pray, shall we? Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are, for you are powerful, eternal, unchanging, and your mercy, they are new every morning. So we thank you that we can come as we are. Very often we come broken, wounded, desperate, empty, guilty, only to be pardoned by the blood of Christ, the Lamb. Yeah, Lord, we thank you because you welcome us with open arms. So where else can we go but be right here in your presence to have more of you, to allow you to mold and change us so that we will be more Christ-like. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and have your ways in us as we worship you. In Jesus' most wonderful name, we pray. Amen. As we gather to worship this morning, may we echo the words of Peter recorded for us in John 6, 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And as we come, may we learn to be like the deer panting for the water, knowing that only He alone can satisfy our hunger and taste. As the deer, as the deer pants for the waters of my soul, long after you, you alone are my heart's desire. I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the ever of my eyes you my friend and you are my brother you're my friend and you are my brother
righteousness the word of God says Jesus is the bread of life he alone can satisfy our deepest needs and longings Jesus is not only the bread of life but he is also the faithful word of God the light in our darkness 
hope for the hopeless, and strength for the weary. The Word of God. The Word of God is light in my darkness. Oh, for the hopeless, strong and true. The Word of God is strength for the weary. A shield for those who trust in you. A shield for those who trust in you. Everything will fade. Everything will fade. The heavens and the earth will pass away. But you will remain. Yes, you will remain. For those who trust in you, let's go. Everything will fade, everything will fade. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but you will remain. Yes, you will remain. Nothing 
Savior I fear, as long as you are near, please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamb unto my feet, and a I will not forget your love for me and yet my heart forever is wandering. Jesus be my guide, hold me to your side, be your word is truly a lamb unto our feet and a light unto our path. So teach us, Lord, to search the scriptures that we may grow deeper and deeper in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now I invite the uh, uh, ushers to come and collect the tithes and offerings. For those of you who still prefer to give online, you may Scan the QR code there. Let's stand for the doxology.
Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for being our Savior, healer, and deliverer. We recognize that it is in your presence that lives are transformed, chains are broken, and hearts are healed. We ask for your spirit to move mightily among us, creating an atmosphere where your glory is revealed and your love is experienced. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we failed to give you thanks and glory and honor, taking for granted your goodness and mercy and faithfulness. Fill our hearts, Lord, with your love, compassion, and understanding, enabling us to embrace one another with open hearts and forgiveness. Help us to value one another's unique gifts and perspectives so that we may serve and support one another in love. We ask for your Holy Spirit to touch the hearts of our children and youth, drawing them into a personal relationship with you. Let them encounter your love, grace, and truth. Strengthen their faith, deepen their understanding of your word, and equip them to live bold with as bold witnesses for you. We pray for those who are unwell physically and emotionally, that your touch would bring them healing and strength, restoring them fully. Anoint Pastor Kok Singh and his words as he shares from your word this morning. And we, may we have open and obedient hearts. Thank you for hearing our prayer as we continue to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, church. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Um, it's November, so um, coming to the end of the year. So today is the first Sunday in November, so as uh, our practice, together as a family, we come together to partake the Lord's Supper. And I'd like to invite all who have been baptized here or in another Bible-believing church uh, to join us uh, in this uh, Lord's Supper. Now coming to this Lord's Supper, as we all know, it's not because uh, we must, but because uh, uh, you may, yeah? Not because uh, we are strong, but because we are weak and not because of any goodness uh, or faithfulness that's in us but, um, or, or, or the rights that's in us, but because we need mercy and we need help uh, from God. So come also because you love the Lord. You love the Lord uh, for what He has done. And come because the Lord also loves you and also He gave Himself for every one of us. So right now, let's come together to the table to meet the risen Christ, for together we are His body. Now, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.23. Uh, if I may uh, request every one of us to read these uh, few verses together. Verse 23, For I received what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So, brothers and sisters, the Lord's Supper, which you are about to uh, take partake together, 
is a celebration, it's a feast of communion, it's a feast of remembrance, and it's a feast of hope. Yeah? We remember our Lord Jesus, who is our King. He came down from the heaven, and He came to uh, die on the cross for us. And by that act itself, uh, the penalty for all the sins of humanity is actually paid for. And not just that, He was resurrected. And with that resurrection, uh, basically, victory has been won. Yeah? Uh, no more death. Right? And we have got the hope of eternal life. We have that hope in Jesus Christ. So as we partake in this sacred meal, uh, let us reflect. Let us reflect on the love and sacrifice of our Savior. And as we reflect, may, may it uh, reinforce and may it strengthen our faith and unity in Him. You know, uh, Paul continues from uh, verses 27 to 29, and I'll read them, saying, Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Therefore, um, it is necessary for us to be faithful to the meal as we come together here before the table and that we do not partake in an unworthy manner. But we are um, exhorted by Paul to examine ourselves. Hence, let's take this time, a quiet time, where you are um, a quiet reflection and confession before God right now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we give you thanks for the many acts of love and deliverance you have rendered throughout salvation history. Thank you for your forgiveness of our sins. And also especially thank you for your greatest act of love in giving your only Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior for the lost humanity. In your Son's most precious name, we pray. Amen. And so, having given thanks Jesus brought the bread and said this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way after supper he took the cup and he said this is this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as you drink it in remembrance of me so, I would like to uh, right now uh, invite our brothers, uh, Johnny and uh, Koping, to come forward to help us to distribute the elements. Yes, please come forward.
the body of the Lord who, who died to, break us, uh, to make us one. Let's eat with a grateful heart. The cup represents the blood of Christ who sealed the covenant of forgiveness forever. Let's drink with a grateful heart. Let us pray. Your death, O oh Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection, we confess. Your final coming, we await. Glory be to you, O Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, we who drink his cup, Bring life to others, we whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. stand and sing this preparatory song for the message.
So from today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 17. So uh, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through good faith, uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. May God bless the reading of his word. Okay, good morning once again. This November, uh, all our messages will be touching on um, these five solas. Sola Scriptura, Gratia, Fide, Christus, and Deo Gloria. These are Latin words that say, Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and uh, glory of God alone alone. Now, these concepts are actually rooted in the uh, Reformation led by Martin Luther, and they are foundational to Protestantism. Luther's challenge to the corrupt church practices in 1517, slightly more than 500 years ago, ignited uh, this Reformation, leading to the rise of Protestantism, which also led to denominations like Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, so on and so forth. Okay? So these five solas are not simply slogans. Uh, they are not just slogans, okay? but they serve as a good uh, summary of the Reformed faith, showing the glory of God's gracious way of salvation in a way that sets the tone the tone for our uh, theology as we know it today and resounding in how we think and live in this world as a believer. Now this morning, I will be touching on Sola Scriptura, the scripture alone, through Paul's letter to his young protege, Timothy, in the epistle of 2 Timothy, that scriptures, scripture is still relevant dependable for us today and tomorrow. In fact, for life. But first, let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for this amazing privilege of gathering here together to worship you and to study your word, knowing that if we study your word, we shall be made wise unto salvation by faith in Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, Come, open our hearts, help us to be attentive now to receive the timeless truths contained in today's passage. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I won't have many slides uh, with uh, pointers uh, today uh, because I will be telling a story. 
I will be narrating a story and the scripture itself will be our slides. This passage is a narrative. What is a narrative? It's actually historical events presented in a storytelling format. Um, in fact, the whole of the Bible, about 48% of the Bible is actually narrative. Okay? And so it is good and refreshing to read the Bible on your own as a story, especially when the passage is a narrative. Okay, this past few weeks, right, uh, may have been very busy, stressful, and um, somewhat challenging, uh, emotionally draining, and even possibly uh, mentally overwhelming. For many of us, yeah, um, our young, most of our young have just finished their big exam for the year, uh, although some are still on it. And some of us are grappling with uh, health issues, financial concerns, or challenging re relationships at work, uh, at home, so on and so forth. And some of us may even be experiencing major transitions in life. A few of us might even be struggling with our own spiritual walk. Now, if you aren't facing any of the above, I'm sure, I'm sure your heart will be heavy laden with all the evil that's going on in the Middle East and the world. And if you still don't feel a bit of any of the above, please check to make sure that you're still breathing and alive. Okay, because young and old, I don't think we can uh, escape from any of this, right? Because we are in the world. For Jesus says in Matthew 24, watch for signs of end time. All the problems and issues we are seeing and experiencing today are but the beginning of birth pains. Beginning of birth pains. Meaning, the worst challenges and tribulations, whatever we are going through in life right now, difficulties, will increase in intensity, similar to the increasing pain of a woman in labor, leading to a significant event associated with the return of Christ. In short, life is getting more and more intense, right? Complicated and stressful. For many, if there is a such thing as an index Okay, and a measurement, an index of fear, anxiety, uncertainty, insurmountable expectations, hopelessness. Your index reading would likely be very high today, comparing to just even five years ago. It's in these moments of turbulence that the question will arise. What am I to do? Where can I find help? To whom do I turn to? Answers to these questions are found in today's story, Paul's writing to Timothy. The world of Paul and Timothy back then is also mired in selfishness, narcissism, and moral ambiguity. The, Im the imagery that Paul paints is strikingly familiar, mirroring the very issues uh, we are grappling with today, actually. Second Timothy is probably the last letter uh, of Paul, the last letter Paul uh, ever written. How do we know this? Internal evidence found in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 4 point to this letter as Paul's final letter written from Rome just before his martyrdom. So, when a man is at the end of his road, he doesn't waste time talking about the weather. He doesn't waste time talking about, you know, his wealth, right? Paul knew his time was coming to an end very soon. And so, he penned his final words to his beloved disciple. We know Timothy is his beloved disciple because chapter 1, verse 2, he addressed the letter to Timothy, my beloved child, imparting not just knowledge, but the essence of faith tested by fire. Now you see, Timothy is a young man and he's a bit timid. Maybe because being a young man, he's a bit timid. And at the time of writing, Timothy is a young pastor. Uh, you may call him as a young pastor of a congregation in Ephesus. And at that point in time, the church uh, uh, is actually facing serious persecution challenges and deceptions in Rome. Paul is concerned for Timothy's life of faith and ministry. 
and Paul wrote to uh, Timothy because he feels that it is his um, responsibility as his mentor and teacher and wants Timothy to know what the real world is like so he would stand firm and will not crack in the face of persecution and trials. Uh, pretty much like how our fathers, our mothers uh, were to us, uh, for, uh, for, for every one of us and even for the young, pretty much how your parents are to you. Okay? They want you, uh, they only want good stuff for you okay? so that you can live your life well so that you will stand firm, so that you will not crack in the face of trouble. For Paul knew very well what the world was like because Paul has been there, done that. From the book of Acts, we know Paul was on the side of uh, persecuting the church as a zealous uh, Pharisee, right? From the uh, book of Acts. And after encountering and being saved by the Lord on the way, on his way to Damascus, he became a missionary for God, preaching the gospel to Gentiles wherever the Spirit uh, brought him to. And in the, process, in the process, he experienced much more persecution and trials than anyone else. For we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, just five verses, Paul recounts being imprisoned much more than any other people endured severe beatings, facing death multiple times, received rotan, uh, 40 lashes, um, stoned once, shipwrecked three times, uh, spent a night and a day adrift in the open ocean. He experienced constant dangers from various sources, bandits, uh, his, his own uh, fellow Jews, Gentiles, and even false believers. And the list goes on. Despite his dangerous and tireless labor, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, and exposure to cold, Paul kept going. What is he made of, I wonder, don't you? What kind of battery is he running on? Definitely much better than the Tesla. His unwavering dedication and commitment uh, to spreading the gospel during these immense trials and tribulations is tremendous. Therefore, Paul is, in, is much more qualified, is actually qualified uh, to dish out warnings to uh, Timothy when he says, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Chapter 3, verse 1. Paul knows what he's talking about, telling Timothy, end times will be hard, will be fierce, will be harsh. Do not be surprised but be aware and alert. Know what's coming and learn from my experience how to overcome. Paul warns Timothy and us too. Okay? Three things to watch out for in the uh, first nine verses of chapter 3. We need to watch and pray as uh, taught by Jesus in Matthew 26, right? And not live like everyday Sunday, eh? like everyday living in uh, Disneyland. Okay? First, we need to watch out for godless people. Verse 2, for people will be what? Lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Godless people are depraved people. Lovers of self instead of lovers of God. Now, these people are not very far off from us today, right? These people are not very far off from us today. For sometimes, some of this, we can also relate to and understand. Indeed, these characteristics described here are alarmingly prevalent in our society today. It is so deafening. It is the, the, the deafening volume of their presence is unmistakable. For example, the voice of alternative lifestyle is getting louder, right? Compared to five years ago, ten years ago, and gaining broad-based acceptance. Greater evils are committed shamelessly without any conscience, practically every day. 
it's not just in Middle East that we, you know, we, we saw recently, but everywhere. Underscoring the urgency of Paul's warning to us, watch out. As these godless characteristics permeate through the very fabric of society and our life. So, watch out for godless people. You know, godless people, when they are loud, uh, it's, it's easy to spot them. You can hear them miles away, okay? And you can stay uh, away from them. However, it is not so when they appear to be like one of us. Imagine if you're in a room filled with a dozen fresh eggs. However, there's one rotten egg. But all the eggs look identical from the outside, right? Okay? You can't tell which one is rotten just by looking at them. In a similar way, in our lives, it can be challenging to identify negative influences or toxic people within a group. Okay? Within a church even. Just by their outward appearances. So be aware. Be aware that bad people can also come from within. So to our young, be careful. Be careful who you mix around with, be it friends from school or online friends. Paul wants Timothy to watch out. Watch out for deceptive influences, even from within. Uh, for they, verse 5, uh, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. They may carry the Bible around. They may bow their heads, give thanks before meal, and pray. Just like the Pharisees, right? Okay? Or just like some devotees of some other faith. However, they do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have never repented and come, and they come with a harmful intent. Harmful not necessarily explicitly. Harmful intent in a sense of selfishness. Yeah. Yeah. So these are what Jesus describes as wolf in the sheepskin. Matthew 7 verse 15. Paul says, avoid such people. Avoid such people. And these people would target a weak women. Verse 6, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak uh, women, burdened with sins and led astray by various uh, passions. They sought to enter homes. Why? Because in the traditional Greek culture at that point in time, most women, uh, they were homemakers. And therefore, they are, they are more gullible. They are more gullible as they have less education and opportunity to exercise certain critical moral uh, faculties. And we see this happening in the online space today, is, isn't it? In 2022, victims of internet love scams in Singapore lost a total of 35.7 million Singapore dollars. Now, these deceptive people use deceptions and use deceits to lure, trick, con innocent people out of money and love. So watch out. Watch out for deceptive people. For they exist and they are rampant in our world today. Even from within the church, unfortunately. Now these people are actually false teachers, learners. Because they, they are always learning. Never able to, never able to uh, arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Verse 7. They don't learn. They are always flying around. Yeah, they don't land. They float around like conspiracy theorists. Have you ever, you know, uh, spoken to your friend or someone whom you know and they come to you and they ask all sorts of questions about Christianity, about faith, then whatever answer you give, uh, they will sure have smana to throw in on. Right? Yeah, they are not genuine uh, truth seekers. No matter how much truth you present, they will throw in another spanner to deny the truth. Paul says, watch out for these false learners or teachers. Today, the world is complex, confusing, convoluted, to a large extent, polarized because of these false learners or teachers. Look at the falsehood some professors have been brainwashing their students with in the Ivy League universities across America recently. Yeah, Redacting changing, redacting history behind the conflict in the Middle East, painting falsehoods, stirring hatred, and glorifying violence. So much so that students are taken in 
and, and, and they take to the streets uh, in demonstration, denying the very atrocities captured on film ever took place. How blinded can one be? Sadly, some of us or some of those well-known uh, universities actually have their roots in Christianity, established by fervent and devout disciples of Christ and missionaries in yester years. Yet today, today there exist false teachers within who are likened to verse 8, Janice and Jambres, opposed Moses. They are the opposers of truth, opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the truth. You know, both names, right, although they are not found in the Old Testament, okay, both names are not found in the Old Testament, are traditionally linked to the magicians in Pharaoh's court who opposed Moses in Exodus chapter 7. Paul metaphorically uses uh, Janice and Jambres to depict those who resist God's teachings. They symbolize deceit and opposition to truth. Similar to those, uh, to how these are magicians who opposed Moses. Now, these false teachers uh, in our world today are also opponents of truths, possess corrupted minds, uh, lack faith, and attempt deception. However, we all know the Bible, the Bible that I read, that you read, we all know that the folly will eventually be exposed, emphasizing the eventual triumph of truth over deceit. Verse 9. Now at this point, eh, at this point in time, just imagine, you know, Timothy reading this letter uh, from Paul, his teacher, his mentor to him. Okay, reading Paul's warning, Timothy is likely uh, right now experiencing mixed emotions. He would have concerns, apprehension, and may, maybe even doubts of his faith and of his ministry. He's alone there. Paul is not with him by his side, right? But Paul, in the letter, wrote a, uh, a, a series of warnings to him. Now, all these emotions swirling within him as he contemplates the challenges ahead. We will feel the same way. Do you know that? We will feel the same way. Think, think for a moment. If you're entering a new phase in life, new job, new business, yeah? um, new school, right? Uh, Zane, you'll be going to university. So new school, right? Uh, NS, uh, for, the, for the boys, uh, James going NS uh, next year. Uh, Joshua already in NS right now, okay? Or, or some of us may be planning to go uh, overseas for work or to do cross-cultural mission, so on and so forth. Now imagine you have all this planned out and someone or I, I come to you and say, and watch out, you know, watch out for godless people, okay? Deceptive influences and false teachers. Now, how would this make you feel when you hear this? You will, you know, be a bit sweet or unsteady, right? On top of that, oh, by the way, the world is not pretty, eh? I know because I've been there, done that your alarm bells would tri be triggered. You will pause, rethink again whether it is still a good idea to proceed. Should I? Should I not? What ifs? How should I face all this? Now, Timothy, Timothy too will be feeling the same way right now, reading the letter. His confidence would be shaken somewhat, his conviction and faith be put to the test. But, but, Paul, Paul knows because he's been there, done that. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, this is what you have seen and learned from my experience, says Timothy. Verse 10, you have followed my teaching. You have followed my way of life, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, as in my endurance. Now, where do you think all this comes from for Paul? And he continues, verse 11, as well as the persecutions you have seen, you have heard my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, and in Lystra. I endured all these persecutions. Now, these places are mentioned only. Of course, Paul 
uh, has faced persecution in many more other places also. But only these three places are mentioned specifically in this letter. Why? It's probably Timothy would have, um, it, is, it, it is probably uh, because these places are actually near where Timothy stay, okay? Uh, Timothy's hometown, where he would have heard of uh, Paul's uh, opposition, persecution, and physical harm in those places. As well as, Timothy may have even witnessed uh, Paul being stoned and left for dead, uh, dead by the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, according to Acts 14, uh, verses 19 to 20, in Lystra. Paul says, you know, Timothy, how did I go through all that? Paul says, the Lord rescued me. Right at the end of verse 11, the Lord rescued me. The weight the weight of Paul's words, right, in this letter at this point in time, really settled upon Timothy like a father giving words of wisdom to his son. After all the warnings in the first nine verses, Paul says, You, however. Paul's voice carries a depth of experience and wisdom. You, however, have heard me teach, have seen me in action. I have opened my heart. I have opened my life to you. Now, here is an example of a mentoring uh, relationship, okay? Doing life together. I've opened my, my heart and my life to you. Now, the words in verse, verses 10 and 11 serve as both a challenge and a promise weighing on Timothy's shoulders like a dead weight of responsibility uh, passed down. The Lord rescued me. The change in Paul's tone from verse 10 suggests more than just a physical rescue. You know how is it like sometimes when we pray for something and actually it happened, we are very elated and we just look at what happened, right? Okay, so over here, uh, Paul is conveying more than just the, the physical deliverance or the physical rescue. It conveys an inner strength, profound peace, and enduring faith granted by the Holy Spirit in the face of challenges. Paul, he had faced many trials, suffered persecutions, yet he stood unwavering, endured them all. Why? The Lord rescued me, says Paul. Now, if Paul, if Paul stops at verse 11 and he didn't go any further, do you think Timothy's confidence will, will go up or go down? Okay, think about it. Timothy's confidence at that point in time, if Paul stops at verse 11, Timothy's confidence would be based only on what Paul says. And Paul, after all, is a man. He's a sinner, just like you and me, right? Okay, his confidence will be based only on what Paul says, his teacher, mentor, and a man, right? And, and whatever he says can only go so far. Correct? We will still be left wondering, what do you mean, Paul? Similar to how we will feel often when we listen to testimonies of well-meaning friends and believers, right? You know, imagine I stand down here, I share with you my testimony, and I stop at verse 11, oh, the Lord rescued me. Then it's like, so, what's, what's, what's next? What's more? You know, anti-climax, right? Yeah? So, we will be left with some lingering doubts thinking, Yes, God bless you. God is good for you. But how can I too be blessed? Timothy would also be thinking, Paul, you've been you, you have experienced God's grace. I believe you. But how did it happen? Now, Paul, being wise and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knows it is not enough to just share his own testimony and experience alone. It will be an incomplete solution or answer. It will be half-truth. And half-truths, uh, brothers and sisters, are very dangerous. Okay, never give half-truths. Having warned Timothy about the challenges and deceptions that would arise, he now points Timothy with unwavering confidence to the anchor that sustained and carried him through all his trials and tribulations. Answering to Timothy's how question. Paul first uh, reminds Timothy 
as a matter of fact that, verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Godly life doesn't shield us from challenges. Godly life doesn't shield us from making hard choices, hard decisions. Rather, godly lives invite persecution, problems. Evil influences will persist, trying to lead us astray, trying to draw us away from God. There will be challenges, persecutions that come with living a godly Christian life. Now, this is a given. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, you know, window dress it to make it more palatable, but this is what the Bible says. Okay? It is a given. We must anticipate and be ready to face life challenges when we choose the path of righteousness. This truth is evident in Paul's own journey as a follower of Christ, as seen in his testimony. According to Paul, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. Verse 13. The world before Timothy's eyes right now will be getting from bad to worse. This is what it says. And this means that our world today, our world today, before our very eyes will also be getting from bad to worse. Jesus tells us that in the end times, lawlessness will be increased and love of many will grow cold. God forbid that it happen to us. Yeah? This Matthew 24. Evil will increase, love of many will grow cold. Double whammy. Can you imagine the weight on Timothy's shoulder has just been multiplied reading this letter up to this point? Like being caught in the middle of a storm where everything suddenly becomes intense and overwhelming. Ever felt that way? Or maybe right now you're feeling that way with whatever that's going on in your life. Caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. I reckon this is how Timothy must be feeling. The weight of the warnings from Paul, coupled with the knowledge that the world is spiraling into chaos, can evoke a sense of deep concern, apprehension. Are you in this tight spot right now? But obviously, there is a good news, okay? But as for you, Paul emphatically exhorts Timothy. But as for you, Timothy, you are to continue in the same path. Paul encouraged Timothy to continue in the same path. What path? Continue. Continue in what you have heard. Continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have seen. Continue in what you have firmly believed. Verse 14. Paul is saying, Endure, persevere when the storm hits, for you have seen and heard my testimonies, Paul's testimonies, and you know the word of God. The word of God has taught to you from young. By who? Your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice. Chapter 2, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Timothy was actually schooled from young in the Old Testament uh, writings and have learned the need for forgiveness, provision of God, necessity of faith. And he had also been discipled by Paul, learning about Christ and the church. And in each case, Timothy had not only been given the knowledge, Timothy was physically present and Timothy, he himself had been a witness to godly lives. Witness to godly lives. Every one of us has got to be a disciple of Christ and has got to be a discipler of Christ too. Okay? We have got to live our life as a disciple and as an example of what a disciple should be like. Okay? So, now, where am I? So, Timothy, he himself is a witness to godly lives, and godly lives that are anchored and rest upon the power and the authority of the word. This godly life is, na- is not based on, uh, you know, last time when I was young in school, there is this uh, moral education class, right? Okay, this godly life is not based on just those um, lessons. This godly life is really based on the power and authority of the word, okay? Every word in Paul's letter isn't just ABC, isn't just describing ancient texts, 
okay? They are not simply alphabets forming words. He is revealing, Paul is revealing a living, breathing truth, a divine essence weaved into every word. The same scriptures Timothy had known since childhood, they are not just bedtime stories only. Yeah, they are not just bedtime stories. They were, they are God-breathed, inerrant, infallible guide through life's complexities. The word and substance came from God and it is the whole foundation of Paul's, Timothy's and our existence as believers woven into the fabric of our lives. Therefore, Paul highlights and exerts verse 16, okay, the popular verse 16 that we always quote, Scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now here it is, the Word of God, the divine revelation, truth incarnate that has sustained, kept Paul going, going through his trials, tribulations, rescued him, nothing else. Paul is saying nothing else, not man, not anything. Yeah, nothing else except God. Through Jesus Christ in the Word. In acknowledging God's authorship, Paul acknowledges God's authority over every aspect of his life. By stating that scriptures are God-breathed, Paul establishes the Word as God's power and authority over all people. So here is the point, the answer to Timothy's how question. The enduring power and authority of God's word, a steadfast guide for Paul in a tumultuous a world then as well as today and tomorrow. Paul illumines Timothy that the word of God is not just mere human words, it's not just my, my word, okay, um, but divine revelations directly uh, inspired and breathed out by God. Now to understand this, right, we have to go to John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 and verse 14. To understand this profound term, breathed out, what is breathed out? John chapter 1 and uh, verse 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth the word became flesh the word became jesus christ yeah became flesh he's the only son from the father full of grace and truth the word is god jesus christ incarnate grace and truth so just as the scriptures carried Paul through oppositions, persecutions, afflictions, and trials, they stand as the unwavering foundation upon which Timothy can trust, Timothy can depend on, can draw strength and resolve. For the word is the power and authority, granting to him all that is needed, teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, to face and overcome the challenges and the weakness of in this world. And for what? To be competent, equipped for every good work. Verse 17, ordained by God. Every good work, ordained by God. Now tying this, all this back uh, to the earlier warnings. Uh, after reading up to this point, I'm quite sure Timothy will be very encouraged and Timothy all of a sudden will be very clear with his destiny, right? Okay, he'll be very encouraged to know God, God himself, Jesus Christ, in the form of the word. He has the word. He, he knows that God, Jesus Christ, the word is with him. And the word, the scripture itself, is his defense as well as his offense against the deceitfulness of godless individuals, uh, of manipulative influences, and of false prophets, false teachers and learners. It will surely sharpen his discernment, allowing him to identify the counterfeit amidst the genuine. His confidence will go up. 
The wisdom drawn from God's word empowers him to withstand and overcome the pressures of an increasing secular world. Then, as well as the increasing secular world that we ourselves are living in right now. Now, as we draw this narrative to a close and back to the question asked at the beginning, you may be facing some challenges in life right now. If you, if you do not have, you're not facing anything today, uh, mark my word, uh, it will come tomorrow. Yeah? Now, when it comes, what are you to do? Where can you find help? To whom do you turn to? Remember the words of Paul to Timothy in this narrative. Chapter 3 of uh, 2 Timothy. Scripture, scripture is your only guide and hope. Just as how Paul has depended and relied on scripture alone to go through all his many trials and tribulations. In our increasingly turbulent world, deceptive lurks at every corner. Chaos, uh, conflicting voices will grow louder and louder. And the evil one is actually working on overdrive and overtime. And the word of God remains unchanging and reliable in all its power and authority. For it is the living, breathing Christ himself, God himself. And therefore, turn to the word. The word is the anchor in, the, in your storm. It's the light in your darkness. It is your guide when the path seems unclear. In times of uncertainty, it will provide uh, it will provide clarity. In moments of doubt, it offers assurance. And when Paul speaks of all Scripture, right, verse, six, uh, verse 16, speaks of all Scripture, he's referring to the entire God's revelation, both Old and New uh, Testament, not just chapter 3, verse 10 to 17. No, it's not just that. It's the whole Old Testament, New Testament, the whole Bible. It is this comprehensive truth that equips us for every good work. In a world where moral standards shift, truth subjective, ideologies clashes, scripture remains the unwavering measure of right and just. It corrects our misconceptions, reproves our wrongdoings, and train, trains us in our ways of righteousness. So, let the scriptures be your guide, your source of strength, and your armor against the darkness. When life feels overwhelming, know that God's word provides the clarity we seek, the power we need to live a godly life amidst the chaos. Whatever you are troubled by in life, big or small, there's power and there's authority in the word. Okay, Turn to the word, depend on the word, lean on the word, be guided by the word, just like how it has guided and helped Paul and helped Timothy too. Whatever you're facing today and tomorrow, take heart, turn to the all-powerful and authoritative word of God, timeless, unchanging word of God in an ever-changing world. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for reminding us this morning of the enduring relevance of Scripture in our lives. Help us to internalize these truths and empower us to live according to your divine will. And as we go from here, may we go in confidence, in confidence of who you are, in confidence of Jesus Christ and in confidence of the word that is with us. And may the word continue to resonate in our hearts and guide our actions. Grant us strength to rely on the scripture alone, finding comfort and assurance in, in your unchanging word. We commit ourselves into your hands, trusting in the timeless power and authority of your word. We pray all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Pastor Kok Seng for the message. Very encouraging one. Uh, yeah. I personally have gone through quite a bit of things, trials, persecution, not persecution, but more on trials in the last five months. And uh, <coughs> there are always two questions that come to me when whenever I go through that. And one of them is, how can? And the other question is, how long, Lord? You know, waking up in the middle of the night and asking. But I, 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 I've learned that also through all this, we also should ask ourselves, why not? Why not? And I think God's word is very uh, good and showing us that, you know, I mean, for my, for my case, the, the verse always come to me is, my grace is sufficient for you. Shall we all stand and sing this closing song? Good morning. 
Thank you, uh, Mark and the uh, worship team, all the AV guys and everyone uh, who served and contributed uh, this morning one way or another. And thank you and welcome every one of you uh, for being here uh, this beautiful Sunday. Um, yes, and I would like to uh, welcome uh, Julie and also Wendy who brought a friend, uh, Jackson. Yes, Jackson, welcome. Uh, as we know, uh, Julie and Wendy, they are our sisters uh, from the Chinese congregation. And also, I'd uh, like to welcome our youngest, baby Josiah, uh, inside there. <laughs> so later on, yeah, y'all can go and, uh, yeah, so cute. Okay. Um, and also like to um, well, welcome my daughter, Kayla. Uh, she's here with us today. <laughs> okay, let's rise right now and uh, let's go and extend our hands of welcome to each other, yeah? Okay, so uh, let's continue the fellowship after this, okay, downstairs. Uh, thank you, uh, Bipeng and the team, for providing the food uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, so now it's beginning of uh, November, right? So uh, earlier on, I mentioned uh, uh, the messages in uh, no November uh, will be related to uh, the five solas, yeah? And um, uh, next week, I'll be, uh, the message will be on grace, yeah? So if you all want, you all can go and start reading on uh, John chapter 8. Uh, verse, uh, verse 11 verses uh, You can read before and after also But uh, yeah, that will be the uh, main, main passage for next week And the following week, uh, Pastor Ping will be here uh, To share with us on uh, faith yeah? And uh, he will also, after the service He will also be sharing uh, uh, with us uh, for the CE hour About making sense of God's word Okay, so yeah, sometimes God's word may not make sense to us But you know we have got to persist and continue to learn and continue to hear the word of God until it makes sense, right? And um, prayer. So next, uh, next, Sunday, uh, next Sunday will be our family prayer after service, half an hour. And also um, on the 25th November, Saturday, there will be the uh, 8 a.m. Uh, family prayer. Uh, please uh, welcome to join. Uh, in fact, I will encourage every one of us to pray together as a family. Uh, monthly sub. So start will be on uh, 25th uh, November, once more after the family prayer, 9 a.m. to 10.30. Um, I think that's all for, uh, for the announcement. Um, let us rise right now for uh, the blessing. May Almighty God make you faithful to His calling, cheerful in His service, and fruitful for His kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and through you with all those to whom He sends you, now and forever, always. Amen.
come to the end of our service. If you need prayer, do come forward. And pastor will be here to pray for you. We want to thank uh, 10 Minutes CG for the breakfast this morning.